we're recording. We're recording now, just so you all know. The Associate Clinical Educator is a lay educator trained in the body system examinations who is designed to support the learning of medical students and physician associate students. At the moment, we are working in mainly with physician associate students around the country, also in pharmacy, uh, parts of medicine for Birmingham, and uh, musculoskeletal work at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital in Birmingham. My name is Mark Reynolds. I'm a senior associate clinical educator. In fact, I think I've got the honor of being the one on the books with the, the, the longest serving one. We have six speakers today. I'll be talking about their role and the role of the associate clinical educator within their work. Uh, if you do have any questions to pose to our speakers, please put them in the chat box. Hope you all know where the chat box is on a PC. It's located at the bottom of the screen. Put your questions in the chat box and then after the speakers have indeed spoken, we'll be having a short comfort break and during that time we will look at your questions and we will give them to the appropriate speaker for them to answer. Also during the comfort stop after the speakers, we'll be posting a short video on YouTube for you to watch during the break, if you wish, showing the role of the Associate Clinical Educator in action. This, of course, this video will be available on YouTube for you to watch at your leisure if you don't get the time to watch it today. I want to bring on my colleague, Bob Spohr. This is Bob. Bob is the founder of Meducate. And also online today, we have Matthew Chapman, the managing director of Meducate. So Bob set up the company a few years ago. But our first speaker, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Jim Powell, is the medic who invented the associate clinical, edu clinical educator role. So we're indebted to Jim, indeed, for having a job. So I'd like to invite Jim to speak now. Um, Jim also set up the Physician Associate Programme at the University of Birmingham. And so I invite Jim now to speak uh, as our first keynote speaker this morning. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, and thanks very much, Mark, for the introduction and the uh, overarching review that you just gave. Um, so I'll, I'll load straight in. A very brief bit of history. I've been involved with uh, the ACE kind of process for some, oh gosh, 15, 18 years or so. I'm a retired professor of general practice at the University of Birmingham, um, and I've been using ACEs and similar kind of approaches to education for a long time. So what I'm going to do is cover, I'm going to forget history now, I'm just going to go straight in, talk about what ACEs are, why we, why we instituted them, and what sparked my interest. My time in, in academia has been very focused on education, much more than on you know, laboratory or other kinds of research. Initially, uh, we used ACEs in medicine only, um, and then in physician associates as well. So there's an extensive history, um, probably, well, at least 15 years, if not longer. So I'm just going to step back from ACEs as such and say something about simulation and why we need simulation and why I think we need more simulation and why I think we need high fidelity simulation, which I, by which I mean real human beings, uh, not... Um, computers or robots. But obviously there's an ethical issue about uh, performing uh, intimate or any kind of examination on, on patients. Um, we published something about this in the Journal of Medical Ethics a few years ago. You can have a look at it if you wish. But the key thing is that the things we used to do as students when I was a student, which is uh, quite a long time ago, um, we knew they were unethical then. And they're definitely even more unethical if you can have more or less unethical uh, now. And we used to do things without patients' consent. We were introduced as but these young doctors, is it okay if these young doctors examine you? The obvious uh, answer is always yes, because the patient wasn't really given an opportunity to say no. So you should never do this kind of stuff, uh, particularly in some examinations. My first female perfect examination, I can still remember vividly. The patient was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I was incompetent. I don't think I hurt her, but certainly I didn't know what I was doing, and it was ridiculous to, to learn in that way. That's one of the reasons we, we, we need to think about simulation. Um, there's also the point that people need repeated practice and repeated and focused and relevant feedback. You don't really get that from a patient. You examine a patient, and often patients do know whether you're doing a good job or not, but we don't really give them a voice. And so we need to give a patient or a patient substitute, if you like, a voice, which I'll come on to a little bit more later on. There's also the issue that students have different levels. Of, this is obvious. I mean, you know, my, my wife calls me the professor of the bleeding obvious. Um, because it is kind of obvious once you say it out loud, that you need somebody who can work at the level that the student is at. 
We can't expect a real patient to do that. They've got their own problems, their own things to focus on. Um, and ACEs can do that because we, could, we have trained them to be able to do so. They're also able to demonstrate certain kinds of pathology or abnormalities, which are really difficult to obtain for students to learn and certainly for students to be assessed upon. So I'll give you an example. Um, patient comes off his bike or her bike for that matter, injures their chest, maybe a couple of fractured ribs. Two things you'll find when examine a patient like that. One, they're in a lot of pain. Two, they're tender at the rib, but also if you flex the rib. And three, they have asymmetric breathing. And we have taught some of the ACEs, not all of them are able to do this, to do asymmetric breathing. So we can do an extremely convincing uh, simulation with a real person that the student has to interact with just like a real patient they would, but they're not hurting somebody. They're not putting a patient through all that kind of discomfort. Just going to add a couple of uh, other odd things before I <laughs> all preamble, but um, I want you to maybe think about maybe afterwards, if you like, two of the principles that I've brought into the, the way we do this. It was traditional in medicine, and I think it still is really, to learn about normal, to spend a couple of years learning about normal and then start to learn about abnormal. But particularly in physical signs, I put it to you, and I can only assert this, that it's much easier to learn something that's abnormal when you have something normal to compare it with and obviously vice versa. And the PA, sorry, the ACE is able to do this, is able to switch from, take my example a moment ago, asymmetric breathing to symmetrical breathing and back again so the student can see the difference. And we as human beings are good at spotting differences. We're not good at spotting absolute values. And on a similar, but not quite the same theme, I worry quite a lot about, well, I don't lie awake at night, but I, I, could, I am concerned that, um, if we learn something incorrectly, then it becomes difficult to unlearn it. And if I give you an example, if you're extremely good at music, this won't apply to you, but if you're like me and you have to learn a tune parrot fashion, if I teach you a tune, I'm not going to do it now, don't worry, and I put in an incorrect note because I don't know the tune correctly, and you learn it from me parrot fashion, and then somebody comes and says, no, 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 that's a C sharp, not a C. This is how it should sound. Most of us would find that very difficult. We find it difficult to unlearn. And so I think it's really important when students are learning physical examination skills that they compare normal with abnormal there and then, they get immediate feedback and they, um, they, have, they, they are taught what the signs actually are correctly rather than on these, to be blunt, awful mannequins, et cetera, which mostly I think are, are misleading. Now, just briefly an aside, there's lots of pressure on the clinical encounter nowadays. The idea that you can just wander around the wards really fairly randomly like I did as a student is all gone. We've got austerity, we've got COVID, we've got huge increases in numbers. And most of these things apply all around the world. So pressure on clinical learning environments and the clinicians who might teach us has become more and more severe over recent years. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for students to acquire their skills, whether in medicine, physician associates, pharmacy, I'm sure it's true of other clinical professions as well. So we put all this together and say, what is an ACE? An ACE is somebody who's been trained to use their body and their psyche in educating clinicians by responding appropriately when asked to do so by a student, you know, would you please lie on your side or whatever it may be. But they also know, and this is, I think, the special things about PAs, they know I'm gonna call them errors, I don't have a better word, the errors that patients make. So the experienced patient, when you want to take their blood pressure, knows exactly what you want to do. The inexperienced patient doesn't. And if the patient doesn't rest their arm properly, if their uh, shirt is too tight, causing a tourniquet effect, both of those things will affect the blood pressure reading. The beginner has to know that. And so an ACE can teach the student how to do it correctly. What happens if you do it incorrectly? Uh, and you can, you can see the blood pressure go up and down. If, if you try it, lift your arm up and down, flex your muscles, you'll feel, you'll see the blood pressure go up and down. So an ACE can do that back and forth until the student gets the reason for doing it correctly and demonstrates that they can do it correctly. Um, so this is an immediate feedback and students love feedback. They're always asking for more feedback, but this is immediate. It's relevant to the individual student's strengths and weaknesses, and they can improve straight away until they achieve whatever competence we're expecting them to achieve at that time. Obviously, it may not be competence as such. So as well as knowing the errors that 
patients, and I'm sorry about the word errors, there must be a better word that patients make, they also are taught and use the errors that students make. So students, especially as beginners, we don't know what we're doing. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Half the time we, we've spoken about in bits of the body, we have no concept of what we're up to, um, certainly as learners. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you want to examine the patient's retina. So you want to examine the back of the eye. And what you need to do is give them something to look at. You need to keep your head out of the way while you're looking at their retina. And you need to move, you, you know, give them appropriate instructions and so on. But if you don't give them appropriate instructions, don't forget this is often an examination that's done on somebody who's got a head injury or is uh, in some way cognitively impaired, maybe they're drugged or, or drunk. So instructions have to be really clear. So we have taught, firstly, we've taught the ACEs how it should be done. Secondly, we've taught the ACEs the errors students make, for example, getting their head in the way. And thirdly, we've taught the ACEs something which I haven't touched on yet, but will now, which is they know better than any teacher whether the student has performed the examination correctly. So for this example, we've all been to the optician, I'm sure, and they ask you at one point to look at the light. And the reason is they're looking at the macula, which I'm not sure of the background of everybody watching, but it's the bit of the eye that we really use for color vision and for reading and so on. That's why our eyes move up when we're looking at a page. And when you have that, shone, when you have that experience as a patient, you get that sort of rather un almost uncomfortable light in your eye. Therefore, the ACE, having been taught, that's what happens when somebody looks at your macula, is able to tell the student whether they've got it right or not. Whereas when I'm watching, I can't tell. And similarly, we teach the, the ACEs things like, for those who are slim and relaxed enough, I can teach them what it feels like to have their liver edge palpated and what the timing is, is to get that correct, which is quite difficult when you're a beginner student. And the ACE knows what it's like, knows how to do it, knows the errors patients make, the errors students make, and knows whether the student has actually done it or not, which I as an observer don't really know. And certainly as a student, we used to blag that quite a lot because it was too embarrassing to say we didn't know what we were doing. So I'm almost at the end now. Um, one last example of error students make, which I think is quite useful, is, is over complex instructions. And it's much better for the ACE will, if given over complex instructions or instructions that don't work, will do the thing wrong, and then we'll teach the student how to do it right. So in conclusion, I think I would say that what ACEs bring is they can role play, they can demonstrate abnormalities, including in assessments, of course, which is extremely useful. Um, they can understand what errors students make or errors patients make, teach them back to the students so they get it right. And what's the most important thing I want you to remember from what I've said, and I, I believe I'm getting towards the end of my 12 minutes or so, take the clinician out of the room. You do not want a clinician there. If you have a clinician there, you'll inevitably veer into discussions about what, for example, being able to palpate a kidney, does that, what does that mean? Uh, does it matter? Is it, you know, pathological? Da, da, da. You know, students will go down those routes, whereas the ACE can keep the, the, the learning event focused on the student's individual bespoke needs and work with them to achieve, as I said, whatever level of competence, ability, whatever it may be that you're trying to achieve at that time. And I've touched on testing slightly. Of course, we can also use them. You know, anybody ever tested the ability of a student to examine an acute abdomen, let's say an appendicitis in an exam? No, you haven't, because we just couldn't morally do it. You can use an ACE to simulate it, but that's not the most exciting part of it. It's the things that I've discussed in terms of education and feedback. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions at any time through the next couple of hours. Thank you very much, Jim. And don't forget, um, colleagues, that questions should be put into the chat box and we'll sort them out in the break and direct them to the relevant speaker. Thank you. There are three uh, speakers this morning who I've been involved actually with their training, which makes me feel kind of old, but kind of delighted that now they're employing me and I'm working with them. The first is James Ennis, currently clinical lead at the University of Chester, who I believe has put together a presentation, a stat, uh, a stat review of his work with ACEs alongside other methods of simulation. Good morning, James. Good afternoon, James. Good afternoon, Mark. Thank you. I will let you, you know. Okay. okay, good to go. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Bob and Matt, for having me. Um, so I hope you can see. Can you see the slides? 
Yeah, you need to switch to slideshow. Sorry, let me turn my other screen. Yeah. All right. That's it. So um, thanks for having me. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to who I am. So um, I'm a physician associate by background and I've worked with ACEs. I've worked it up for just over 10 years now. I've also um, had training from associate clinical educators. So I've seen it from both perspectives as an educator and as a student. Um, so I'm just going to quickly give you an overview of how we use uh, associate clinical educators at Chester. Now, it's quite a new concept to Chester. I've recently moved from Birmingham up to Chester and brought the associate clinical educator role up with me. Um, and this is a picture of our team. So I'm going to talk about how we use them, where we use them. I'm going to give you some quotes on our student um, experience and our most recent student feedback on the curriculum, on the course, on uh, more importantly, simulation and the ACEs themselves. I am going to try and give you a balanced um, opinion on it because there are some perceived threats in my opinion, and also then the future development within research. So <clears throat> as um, Jim mentioned, we've got a, a strong emphasis on high fidelity with regard to human simulation at Chester. Um, we use ACEs as simulated or standardized patients, typically in role play, and that's both in teaching and assessment. Um, the difference, obviously, between the ACE and the simulated patient, which people are probably far more familiar with, is that they can give this feedback um, on physical examination skills. Now, we've kind of gone away from the compartmentalization of history taking, physical examination skills, and looked at it more as a kind of a, an integrated model, which is how clinicians truly consult. Um, as well as that, we use um, the ACEs in specialist roles for intimate examinations. We um, use the breast teaching associates, again, both in teaching and assessment, uh, as well as the male teaching associates. We're still yet to fully establish the gynecological teaching associates, um, but that's something that I'm working on for 2022. And we also use them in a hybrid approach. So um, again, as, as Jim mentioned, with, with regard to the high, what we would typically um, think of with regard to high fidelity is the all singing, all dancing sim mannequins. Yes, of course, we do use them as well, particularly in emergency scenarios, but we also use the ACEs um, as part of a role play um, so that the communication, again, isn't lost. Again, looking at that integrated model. So where do we use them? Um, this has obviously recently changed, as I'm sure it has for most educationalists during the pandemic. Um, we found that ACE use has become particularly useful or simulated patient use. Um, in replicating current practice with online consultations. Um, and we vary this, you know, again, we think it's useful when a online consultation would be appropriate for a medication review, perhaps, but not if they've got an acute abdomen or suspected acute abdomen, obviously, because they'd be presenting directly to ED. So we try to make this direct relationship cor correlation with um, clinical practice and obviously we're using ACEs in the primarily in the simulation labs um, again like I say for consultation skills teaching and learning the student experience so I've captured a, um, a few of our most recent um, student staff liaison uh, minutes and meetings and these are from our year two students these are uh, kind of common themes, so I've just picked a few just to, to quickly touch on. Um, I think almost, um, almost looking at it completely comprehensively of positive feedback from, from students on the ACE role and what they give, they find it um, far less threatening um, to make mistakes um, when performing physical examinations and, and, and technique refinement. <clears throat> 
as you can see, the first one says they're completely invaluable. However, I would like to, to mention there that it does say that um, mannequins and other types of simulation may be just as helpful. Now, what I would say is uh, I don't see the ACE role completely dominating simulation in medical education. It's very much as an adjunct, and that's how we how we utilize our races. The um, students obviously get quite twitchy around OSCEs and assessment methods. And again, we found ACE is incredibly um, helpful, not just for improving um, students' technique and examination skills, but also um, their confidence going into things like OSCEs and um, ISCEs and um, clinical examinations. A uh, great thing with the ACE teams as well, there's different backgrounds, some have actual pathologies, um, some come from um, uh, a, a diverse background and, and that's something obviously that our students appreciate. Um, <clears throat> and this real life application, as again Jim mentioned. Finally, they, they really um, responded positively to the ACE role in um, working on things that they find specifically difficult. Um, and one of the things that I've highlighted there is the MSK examination. So it's one thing that our races really cover in depth with our students. Um, something that they find difficult and something that our races are, are um, heavily trained in, as I'm sure Uzo will talk about um, far, far greater depth than I can. And like I say, with regard to the COVID restrictions, what we found is obviously we've lost some time and the ACEs have been great in, in building the student um, confidence and um, time in simulation to get them to a point where um, we're happy for um, clinical practice uh, and patient safety ultimately is, is why we're really um, so keen, obviously, all on simulation. So perceived threats, um, I, I'm sure most of you who haven't <clears throat> used ACEs or um, simulated patients in any great um, detail will find that they've had some pushback from their institutes around the financial burden. I mean, the way we've worked around this is I would far prefer to have the human factor, the, the human um, input in simulation and by perhaps an £80,000 um, sim man. Um, yes, I, I mean, they, they, they do have their place, but I would prefer to, um, instead of buying several of them, I'd rather put my, my, our money towards um, ACEs. And there are ways around, around this, I found. Um, I've certainly not had any problems from my institute with, with getting the um, financial buying, shall we say, especially when you're getting such feedback from students. Um, one thing that we haven't got um, a great amount of evidence on is, is the student and patient outcome from such interventions. And that's something I'll come on to later when I'm looking at my, my research. Um, the ACE training, again, we need to invest in that as, as clinicians and as educationalists. Um, and one concern we have is just our geographical area. Um, they're more based in the Midlands, um, but we would love to have our own and um, growing banks in um, uh, Cheshire and the surrounding area. So <clears throat> uh, another two things just quickly, Clinic clinician resource. Um, ACEs are not substitutes for clinicians. They give a very specific and very constructive um, level of feedback. Um, but um, you do need to be mindful that the clinician should be there to cover any clinical um, areas or, or questions. And then again, then ACE regulation recognition needs improvement um, and development, um, especially when we're looking at using um, these trained lay people in intimate areas such as uh, gynecology and um, male genitalia exams, for example. And then finally, that's just a, a quick overview of where I'm going with my research. And um, I would invite anybody to contact me if they're interested in it. Um, we're looking at, um, like I say, the ACEs and particularly the impact of student performance and therefore patient outcome. You know, if we're training via this modality, um, 
what effect is it having on student competency and therefore student performance um, as, as qualified clinicians and therefore patient um, outcomes and safety. Use of haptics, which is to give kind of tactile feedback uh, in, in skill acquisition. And then again, developing further the hybrid approaches, so the uses of SIMS and the more traditional higher fidelity areas. All right, I think that's me, Mark. Thanks. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much indeed. Great. Can you unshare your screen, please, James? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ah, the old technology. I'm terrible at it, which is why I'm just speaking and Bob's doing all the tech because I probably launched two Polaris missiles at Warsaw if I was trying to do the tech this morning. Sorry, am I still sharing? Uh, yeah, I am, aren't I? There you go. There we are. Thank you very much, James. I have a special interest as an AC in orthopaedics, and our next speaker is the gentleman who has trained me up to the standard to that I am today. Uh, Uzo Ekyogu is a consultant in rehabilitation and physical preparation at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital, and I'd like now, Uzo, for you to take the stage. Thank you. I think, Uzo, you're still muted. I'm sorry. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we've got you. Thank you very much. Hi, excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on a on a Saturday afternoon, uh, it's nice and warm-ish in Birmingham. Um, I'll just share my screen if that's okay. Uh, let's get the right presentation. Yeah, it's it's um, okay. Um, okay. Hopefully, it's not going to be too onerous. Um, it's a very short presentation. Um, yeah, so uh, let me introduce myself. So thank you, Mark, for the introduction. So, um, and forgive me if you can hear that noise in the background. I'm actually um, at, at work and there's, a, um, and there's a toilet very close by. I mean, people use the, um, the machine, it goes off. Okay, so the experiences of um, medical simulation in a orthopedic setting. So um, as I already alluded to, uh, so I'm a clinical teaching fellow um, at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital. Um, and so, and also a musculoskeletal physiotherapist as well. So um, I guess it's, it's worthwhile maybe providing some background uh, in regards to um, how, our, how our placements work with our medical students. So we take fourth year medical students um, from Birmingham University and also Aston University. They come along, um, in, in essence, to the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital for their two-week musculoskeletal and also orthopaedic placement. Um, the placement involves, as you might expect, uh, attendance in musculoskeletal and orthopaedic clinics, uh, orthopaedic wards, they go into the wards, they spend time in theatres, um, they have clinical lectures, um, as well from uh, consultants and, and also uh, people like myself as well, um, AHPs. Um, and we try to avoid and we try to provide uh, as broad a orthopedic experience um, for our medical students that we possibly can. And this, uh, and the reason why I tell you this is because it's important, because um, the vast majority of people who actually come on this TV placement do not want to work in orthopedics, do not want to work in rheumatology, um, and they do not want to work in um, sport and exercise medicine. So in essence, um, our customer base effectively um, fundamentally are there because they have to be there. Um, and, and this is where it brings me on to the simulated teaching session. So this is one of, um, I think, you know, it's probably not so unique, but from an orthopedic perspective, I think it's quite unique because um, I think this is the jewel in the crown, if you like. Um, and especially, and especially I would say during COVID, um, where we've been really challenged in regards to um, not being able to have uh, students in theatres, not being able to have students in musculoskeletal clinics. Um, and in fact, actually, um, what we saw during, during our COVID um, period was, you know, we were acutely aware of the fact that, um, you know, and I don't mind saying, you know, we get very good feedback from our students because, you know, fundamentally we treat them as customers and we want to ensure that our customers are, are well looked after. Um, and so consequently, um, everything we put on is really um, with the student in mind. 
But what we had to do during COVID-19 was we had to plan for the eventuality that we would not be able to have them in theatres and also in, in, in the musculoskeletal clinics. So what that meant was we had to upscale um, our medical simulation. Um, and this is where the ACEs essentially came into their own. Um, so we had pretty much a 50% increase in the utilisation um, in, in regards to um, in regards to our use of ACEs, pretty much. Um, so normally we would have a hybrid of uh, volunteer uh, volunteers. So these are um, people who um, often don't have pathology, um, but they were, but they were volunteers um, within the hospital. Um, and so we'd have a 50-50 split um, pre-COVID. But because of COVID um, and, and, and these individuals were at-risk individuals because they were normally retired um, in their 60s, um, we, took, we took the position that we wouldn't use them um, during COVID. But because the medical students were effectively uh, key workers, um, we had to have them in. So in short, the feedback was fantastic. Um, and, you know, as I say, we normally get very good feedback, but, but the feedback was fantastic having, um, having all ACEs. Um, but obviously, um, with all things, there's, there's obviously a cost implication um, associated with that. Um, so what I'd like to share with you is, um, is it, it, this is something I put together this morning, actually. Um, and I think one of the key things, and, and this is, Remember, this is my opinion, um, and, and, and I'm sure people may or may, not, may or may not disagree, but certainly from my experiences over the last four years of working with ACEs quite intimately, um, I think, and this is just my take on it really, I think um, the key thing about the ACE is consistency. That's the key thing that we find is consistency. And over that period of time where we had all ACEs and no volunteers, I would argue that the level of consistency in terms of uh, our simulations increased quite significantly. Um, now, and, but obviously the level of inconsistency goes up when you start to um, use real patients. Um, so I, I, I almost, I put this together purely because uh, I was just thinking this morning, you know, how could I uh, you know, display this pictorially? And I think, well, actually, you know, year one, year two, your ACE comes into their own. Year three and four, the ACE is still really good. Um, but also you can use volunteers as well. Um, you know, um, we're, 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 we're wanting a certain degree of inconsistency because there is, value in some inconsistency as students start to move through um, their education because we're, because we're expecting them to be able to deal with the inconsistencies of clinical practice. Um, so it, it's, just, it's just something I'm putting out there really. This is not evidence-based necessarily. This is more anecdotal uh, personal opinion. But the reason, but, but I guess where that comes from as well, um, and if I show you the next slide was um, prior to me arriving at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital, my boss, um, Professor uh, Ed Davies, um, who's the uh, essentially the director of uh, the academy, um, he was involved in an RCT using fourth year medical students. Um, and when I arrived, um, part of my role was to was 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 to write up uh, some of the qualitative arm of it, um, and that's just the title, really. Um, uh, medical students' perception. It hasn't actually; it's still been written up for publication, but it hasn't been published yet. But essentially. Um, the results were quite interesting because what they provided was they provided, um, you know, if you like, some real life feedback from patients, sorry, from uh, students on the value of real patients, volunteer patients, and also simulated patients. And what I'm just going to run through, I guess, is um, some of the verbatim, uh, some of the some of the verbatim um, uh, quotes that that uh, students have used. Um, so in, in regards to the advantages of using the simulated patients, um, or I say simulated, when, I, when I talk about simulated patients, I'm really talking about ACEs, essentially, sorry, just for, uh, for clarity. Um, and essentially what they said really was, it, part of it was the uh, pressure-free environment, okay, knowing that you could practice um, the orthopedic techniques in a relatively uh, pressure-free environment where um, you know mistakes were allowed. Well, I guess that's consistent across the board, whether it's a volunteer or or it's an ace. But I think for me, consistently over the last four years, where 
um, the value lies, I, I believe, and, and which is invaluable from the customer's perspective, is preparation for OSCEs. Right? The students, when it comes to the preparation for OSCEs, because um, our ACEs are so good, um, and, and also they also have the experience of being in the OSCEs. They have more experience than me of being in the OSCEs. And, and, and actually often, when a student asks me a question about OSCEs, I will often go to an ACE and ask them that question. Uh, or, I will de or, or I will direct a student to uh, an ACE because they actually have that experience. Um, you know, so I think there's real value there. And, and also I think as well, the good thing about ACEs, what, certainly what we found during COVID was because they're so highly trained, um, uh, they're able to offer quite a high level of feedback in regards to the student's technical abilities. Uh, when they're conducting orthopedic examinations. Um, and, and because we had physiotherapists who were deployed who would normally help us um, uh, pre-COVID uh, during the simulations, it essentially fell to myself and my colleague, um, another teaching fellow. Um, so being able to actually, well, I guess having the confidence of knowing that we have, some, we have people that are very competent who actually um, can provide very clear technical instructions around how to conduct a test, um, you know, what it should feel like and so on and so forth really was invaluable, especially during COVID. Um, so if I just, because I'm, I'm mindful that I'm um, probably going to run out of time, um, if I just flick through to some of the advantages of, of using real patients, and again, this is, you know, information which has come from the customer, essentially, the student um, uh, during this um, RCT. Well, in essence, what they said was, Okay, and, and you can see, I guess it kind of makes sense as well, you know, you know, it means you can learn from learning from different patients, you can learn how to recognize real signs and symptoms, you know, you can't simulate um, an anterior cruciate ligament rupture, you can't simulate laxity, um, you know, nobody, you know, can simulate laxity in a real person unless they have it. It's very difficult to simulate muscle wasting and trophic changes unless they have it. Well, of course, there are other things that can be simulated. So, um, you know, there are, you know, there are pros and cons. Um, but also as well, I guess, you know, developing um, the ability to communicate effectively with, with a range of patients, you will get that with real patients. Um, you know, to a certain extent, you'll get that with the ACE, but I guess it's the authenticity, um, you, you know, by having that real patient may, may be slightly greater um, and also you know having the benefit of the patient's personal experience and knowledge of that particular condition because they live with it and they own it therefore um, of course that can be simulated but I suspect the authenticity of that uh, is probably going to be greater with a real patient because it's, it's their symptoms it's their life they're having to live with that um, and I guess the other issue as well is learning how to examine patients who are actually in pain. You can simulate that, of course, but again, it's the, I guess it's the realism, which, um, you know, um, may be better with the real patient. Um, and this is, and, and these are, again, just some of the, um, some of the quotes that uh, students use in regards to the advantages of learning from volunteers. And I guess the key thing here, the volunteer, is like a hybrid. The volunteer is like a hybrid between the ACE and the real patient. Yeah. So the ACE is highly trained, okay, in terms of simulating uh, the case, because um, that's their job. That's what they do. That's what they get paid to do. And they're very good at doing that. A volunteer is just that. They're a volunteer. So, you know, you could argue their level of commitment, which for us is very high, may not necessarily be um maybe maybe commitment's a wrong word to use maybe you know, the level of expertise to actually learn the case may not necessarily be uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> excuse me may not necessarily be as good because they may not be as competent but i guess what what some of the students felt and this is obviously you know um you know these are individual students talking was was that uh, volunteers tended to go off story a little bit um, so that was a little bit more like, it was a little bit more akin to a real patient because they kind of go off piece. They don't quite stick to uh, the case in the same way that an ACE does. Um, and, you know, and some people felt that that was, that that was a good thing. Um, also as well, you know, it was good from a communication point um, because, you know, they didn't, 
they didn't quite phrase things in exactly the same way that the ace would so actually um it was teaching the student to maybe phrase things in a slightly different way rather than the the correct way so i think i i guess in closing i and this is why this morning when i put this together um uh, this morning when i was uh, preparing for this um i sort of think it just got me thinking well you know maybe actually um there is like a hierarchy if you like um around you know the level of inconsistency that you want and i can imagine for a fifth year medical student the last six months okay before they're about to qualify um, and become a doctor um you probably want a high level of inconsistency because you're getting them ready you know um to get into the big wide world um arguably you know uh, but certainly most of my experience lies around the fourth year medic um actually a certain degree of inconsistency is okay but um, we do need a level of consistency for their own learning. So I think what I would say is that, you know, there's a place um, for the ACE, there's a place for the volunteer, there's a place for the real patient. And I guess the difficulty or the, or the challenge, maybe not difficulty, the challenge is maybe just working out, you know, where that lies within your own um, educational settings. But I must say, you know, for us, COVID-19, um, you know, using um, the ACE for us, it was invaluable. We would not have been able to deliver um, the service. And also, interestingly enough, we've recently just conducted a service evaluation of pre-COVID um, versus uh, during COVID um, student satisfaction, you know, and, and, if, and, and for those of you who work with medical students, you will know that they are not backwards in coming forwards um, in terms of telling you what they like and what they don't like. Um, and certainly are looking at our numbers um, in terms of satisfaction, um, the, like our numbers pretty much stayed level in terms of educational satisfaction. And part of that, I believe, is because we had pretty much, we upped our, um, we upped the amount of ACEs and, and the amount of simulation we had um, uh, during that period of time. And, and I think that made up for the shortfall in going to clinics, going to theatres, and also being on wards. Um, so thank you for listening. And um, hopefully, I hope that was useful. Thank you, Uzo. Yes, I was there um, for that incredible run of work at the ROH, and I'm glad it was of huge value. Uh, from my point of view, it was great to be back at work again because COVID put me and my colleagues out of work for about five months. So uh, we were indebted indeed to the ROH at that time for giving us our, our jobs back. Thank you. Um, right, Uzo, could I ask you to take down your presentation, please, sir? Sure. Thank you very um, much indeed. Fair play. Sure. There's no way I would know how to do that. Thank you. Our next speaker, Kate Straughton, uh, once again, uh, somebody who I've been involved with uh, Kate's training back in the day, uh, is senior lecturer, one of the senior lecturers of the Physician Associate Program at University of Birmingham. And if I had a forelock, I would tug it because she is also currently the president of the Faculty of Physician Associates. And Kate is going to talk about how ACE has helped her with her education of PAs. Thank you, Kate. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got no slides. Um, it's reasonably informal, just a few minutes. So um, as Mark said, I'm a, a PA. Uh, I've been qualified for, for a number of years and worked in a few different settings um, and worked in education now for around seven years or so. Um, I've worked in a university that um, did not use role players and simulated patients and instead relied on volunteers um, in its entirety. And I've also worked at, on a different program where I'm at the moment where we rely heavily on um, ACEs and simulated patients and role players. And so I think I just want to talk a little bit about sort of my experiences from being a student, but also from uh, now the other side of the fence and using to train. And actually, it, it comes back to why everyone, what everyone else has said so far, it's about consistency. Um, you, in terms of using the ACEs, um, you have a scenario that you can use to teach and you know that that's what's going to be delivered. You can, you can stop, you can think about it, talk in advance about what you're trying to get out of the system what out of the scenario and it will be delivered essentially that same way now the the, the beauty of having such highly trained um, people with that experience over a number of years now is that they can still flex to suit but within the still within that parameter of of providing a consistent experience so 
you, and what I mean by that is you may find that if, say, if they're doing a history taking, for example, um, you may find that they give slightly different responses or you go down, you know, slightly different routes, depending on how the student interacts with them. But that approach is still consistent in that they would do that to any student that presented the same way. Um, and so, so students will then be able to learn. Um, and, and for me, part of the really useful thing is in the teaching, students will be able to stop, reflect, have a chat with their colleagues, go back in, try it differently and see how the response would be different. Um, sometimes it's about identifying errors and um, sort of being able to iron those out. Sometimes actually it's just about different situations. So for example, um, I recently taught a Breaking Bad News um, session and we used a, we had a scenario which we, we'd used a number of times before, works very well. Um, but one of the students said, um, well, what, what about if? And the scenario was one where, where the patient wasn't expecting the news. It was a surprise to her. So we had to take that into account. And, and the, the student said, well, what about if they're, you know, how would it change if they're already feel like they know, you know, if they, if they already had an inkling that that was the case. And so I said, well, you know, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll run it that way. Um, and the ASIP that, that I was working with was um, experienced enough that we just had a, a very quick chat on um, sort of aside. And then she came back and she ran it in a, a completely different, different style. And the student was able to compare, as Jim was saying right at the start, the student was able to compare the different approaches just right there in front of them to see how, how you need to adjust to suit in a slightly changing environment. And we could almost flip in be between the two scenarios. And that went really well. And the students really appreciated being able to see those changes, um, you know, as we went through. Um, another example that of, of recently, and actually I used Bob for this um, when we were teaching, is we've had students who'd learned to examine. Um, they, they were new, fairly new first year students. They'd gone out in their first hospital placements and then they come back. And they were saying that they, they were just very nervous about examining real patients. Uh, so we were trying to explore why. Um, and it was patients who specifically who were in pain. So they felt they knew what to do. They were comfortable with that, but actually they didn't want to hurt them. And so as a result, they were stepping back and they weren't jumping in. They weren't getting involved. They weren't having that experience um, because they didn't want to cause any discomfort they were a bit nervous about it so they were saying you know it's fine i'll watch this one i'll do it next time um and so we we were able to incorporate that into our teaching and and bob and i ran a session about examining a student in pain um sorry a patient in pain, <laughs> student in pain slightly different <laughs> um, so we had a, a bob doing doing uh, abdominal pain and so the students were almost every single one in the small groups that we were teaching in were really nervous and they just weren't palpating deep enough because they were really worried about hurting him. Um, and that's obviously knowing that this is a simulated patient, but they, they were still really worried about getting in there. And then after hearing, you know, two or three people sort of being told feedback that they needed to press a bit more firmly and so on, you then had someone come in the other way who actually was then overcompensating and saying, I'm not going to be this person and was too forceful actually. And, and, would have hurt a real patient so we had sort of two two ends there but what we were able to do is to pick it apart a little bit and to bob was able to if you like turn on and turn off that pain so you know it, right examine the abdomen examine the abdomen stop keep your hand exactly where it is now he's in pain do it the same way but you still need that same pressure even though it's in pain and we were able to talk about the approaches and you know and, and able to talk through how you would do it and communicating with the patient and all that sort of stuff but the ability to turn on and turn off those symptoms was really useful. And all of the students, again, walked away saying that was a really useful session, that they would they felt much more competent and much more confident, I guess, um, in their, their abilities to go forward. And actually speak, catching up with them later on, they then felt, they then went and got involved because they had that experience. They knew what to do about it. And so they went and got stuck in in the wards and got more out of their experiences in the clinical world than they otherwise would have. Um, the other thing I think that I wanted to raise is that what, what I try to do when I'm working with ACEs is I have a bit of time when I'm there and I'm, I'm involved and I'm, I'm watching what's happening, but I also have a bit of time when I'm not. Because as, as Jim said at the start, that they, they will talk to, if I'm there, they'll talk to me. You know, they, they might ask a couple of questions of the ACEs, but they predominantly talk to me. Um, and actually what we find is if, if we're not around, they, they, they just flip that. They don't not talk, they talk to the ACEs. They will ask the questions. 
Um, and, and the ACEs know the answers to, to, to a lot of these questions. And if they don't, that's fine. We park them. We deal with the themes at the end that come up. Um, but they will tell our colleagues that we work with about concerns that they might not tell us because they're worried about us thinking that they're stupid or you know any kind of that stuff they they worry about what we will think about their academic performance whereas they will admit to things to the aces that oh i haven't actually had a chance to do this yet or i haven't actually you know i didn't feel that i just you know i just just said that i did or, or whatever it happens to be um and so again I'm, I'm really confident i do feel quite strongly that with that little bit of time away away from the academics but in that safe setting with someone who is trained to do this stuff. You do get a, a lot of the, the sort of troubleshooting, but the opportunities for students to raise these concerns that they otherwise wouldn't, which means that we can then tackle things. Um, you know, we, we can talk about things later on and we can tackle those. So again, they go into the clinical environment with more confidence and they're able to get more out of their experiences, which ultimately will help them in the long run. Um, so a little look at my notes here. I think simulation using mannequins and that sort of thing does have its place um i think as with i talk about the pa profession a lot in my role as as fpa president um the physician associate profession that is and we often say you know pas are not the solution to everything um it's about looking what you need what you need and it's about getting that skill mix right to suit the environment that you need and what you're trying to get out of it and i feel here that this is, is very very similar um aces are not the answer to everything they're an answer to a lot and they do it really well so it's about you know being able to stop and consider what do you need from your education and then you know you've got the models the sim that we already talked about the volunteers aces uh, that that kind of spectrum of different different people and facilities i guess um and then and looking at what they will bring to it um and and making a mix but but to be honest the right answer is probably going to be that it, it's a hybrid of depending on what you're trying to get out of it. Um, so James has already said, you know, he teaches with a bit of sim and a bit of ace. He's talked about having volunteers and aces. And I think each place, each method does have its strengths. Um, but I feel like to me, the, the, the training that goes into the aces, and I know we're going to address that later on in the questions. We've had a couple of people talk about that already. But the training that goes in, the confidence that they bring um, and the, the human interaction um, but still maintaining that profession is, professional side is um, absolutely key in, in my mind. Um, and then just finally, very quickly to touch on standardisation, and again, we've already talked about it in terms of assessments, um, that ability to be able to sort of react the same way every time someone comes in. Um, I've, I've used, as I said, in a previous job, we, we used to use on uh, patient volunteers a fair bit. And we would see during the course of an OSCE, the patient would get tired, the patient, you know, their answers would be different, they, they might possibly forget the story, or they might just decide that actually, they're going to ad lib a little bit. Um, you know, and we've seen OSCEs where we've, we've, we've had students having wildly different experiences over the, over the course of a day. Um, and it's just, you know, for, for something like assessments, particularly high stake assessments, you need to be able to rely on that consistency. And I think addressing is those points around patients wobbling around the story, that, that's absolutely true. You know, we've, for everyone here who's clinical, you've all seen that patient who says, well, it was Tuesday and I'll tell you why it was Tuesday. I know it's Tuesday because it was bin day and I put out the green bin and, you know, we get, we, we've all seen that person. Your aces can do that. It just needs to be built into the scenarios. Um, you know, we, we have that, we, 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 I've examined on those scenarios where we have aces who, role players who talk around a situation, but what they'll be able to do in that is they'll know what the key points are and they'll be able to make sure that they are done within the time. And so in an assessment point for me, that's massively key. Um, so I think, sorry, a little bit sort of ad hoc, but I think really I've, I've had extensive experience from sort of from, from both sides, really, from being a student. Um, I was really nervous. I, I didn't have any clinical background. Uh, I was practice manager in a GP practice before I was a PA. Um, and having someone there was so reassuring. Having, having Mark, having the, the rest of the team around as a student was so reassuring. Um, you know, my colleagues, some of, some of whom who, who are on this call who were responsible for training me, and although they are they are very lovely, 
they're also incredibly intimidating because they know so much stuff and they have so much experience and actually being having someone who you could just have that chat to um was invaluable to me it made real life much less scary I felt much more prepared to go into hospital and have a chat with a real person because I'd had a chat with a real person um and and so it did mean that actually I got stuck in and I was prepared to take a history to examine to do things rather than just observing on placement um and that to me is absolutely key so I'm more than happy to to answer any questions about my experiences but um yeah just wanted to come and share my experiences as we go through Thank you very much, Kate. It's interesting to hear that I'm both reassuring and intimidating at the same time. Don't forget, uh, delegates, to put your questions to our speakers into the chat box, and we'll deal with them after the break. Although, oh, he's just wandered off. Although not speaking this morning, I want to say a, a big hello to Mr. David Coons, who's uh, actually online from Maine in the USA. Genuine American physician associate, somebody I haven't seen for many years. And it's good to see you again this morning, David, or whatever time it is in Maine. We believe it's 4 a.m. Fair play to you for being live with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. Thank you. And you raised, no doubt, a very strong copy to us. <laughs> Just keeping you going, eh? Uh, our next speaker is a colleague who is also a friend and somebody I've been involved with his training too. Uh, Pete is a lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton, former clinical lead. And he's going to talk to us this morning about his experiences working online with ACES during the pandemic and how this has affected the students he's taught during this very difficult period. Over to you, Pete. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm just sharing my presentation. Can you hear me OK? Can you guys hear me OK? <laughs> yep. OK, thank you. Maybe I've got a little delay there. Bear with me a second. I will put this on to present before Prof Paul picks me up on it. Am I okay? Am I good to go? Looks good, Pete. Great. Thanks all for some wonderful presentations this morning. Uh, one thing that I was seeing described there actually before I start, and I was thinking about this, the ACEs can provide consistent consistency so, for example, in an abdominal exam, maybe with or without pathology, that's required. They can also provide consistent, seemingly unpredictability. So if you have a mental health scenario, they can seemingly be unpredictable to that student, say with a manic patient, and do the same over and over again. And in scientific and academic terms, that's about repeatability which is a key factor with these guys and essential for the OSCEs. Uh, just moving on to the, the actual purpose of my talk today and, and not uh, treading on others' toes. Um, my talk is about how we adapted in partnership with the ACEs during COVID. Uh, excuse this frivolous uh, thing. They really were the ace of our sleeve. Um, God, I've used this saying so many times, turn your obstacle into opportunity. Uh, it's the only thing we can do. We have no choice. And I would say the most significant challenges to medical or PA education are pretty consistent, both pre, intra or post COVID. It's about how we utilized the ACEs in COVID to supplement these things. And the first thing is placement provision and maintenance. During COVID, uh, hours, clinical hour requirement required that re remain the same. It was really difficult to get students into placements and we certainly couldn't get them into specialties. So what we did is actually in certain specialties like gynecology, um, pediatrics, maybe dealing with the distressed parents, we supplemented the teaching using the ACEs. So we brought some of the things traditionally modeled in placement into the university in the highest fidelity way we could. And of course, what's this about? We need to satisfy our stakeholders, uh, particularly at that point, it was HEE. We were liaising with the PA schools committee all saying, what do we do? And getting ideas from one another. Um, at Wolverhampton and at all places, but we are particularly diverse. We need an inclusive, representative 
uh, curriculum. So I've been pushing uh, Bob's for and Matt and, and Mark to try and get ACEs that are more reflective of various groups. And uh, they've had a big recruitment drive recently and that's, that really is important. Developing a mutuality of engagement with our postgraduate students. Yes, these are level seven. Um, we still need to engage, which is often neglected in level seven teaching actually, with what the students require. Um, now it may differ from what they need, but they have to be involved in it. And that was particularly key during COVID. And what are we doing? We're constantly realigning the constructive alignment process. Now, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but basically, and I only recently learned the constructive alignment term, um, test on what, on what you teach, teach on what you're going to test. And of course, if the national exam changes because of COVID related uh, limitations or practice changes, we need to make sure that occurs both in training and in our assessment. So we followed the world and I worked with Meducate uh, to be flexible. And my colleague uh, who's here, Dr. Guy, who's remaining very quiet and he's much better than me, but less liable to speak, I think would concur. And we had tremendous, uh, as the speakers have alluded to, satisfaction uh, from the students. And this has led to better retention um, and hopefully recruitment of students, consistently good feedback. What are we aiming to do? We're aiming to train safe, effective practitioners. And we, we want students to pass the national exam, which should be a surrogate for safe, effective practitioners. We want optimal employability of graduates, and that's all about the fidelity. And I think we've already alluded to the adaptability of these guys for various scenarios. Listen at Wolverhampton, we are used to transitions. We've had transitions of staff, we've had transitions of head of school, we've had transitions of student demographics, we've had transitions for the grade we accept to train as a PA. Um, they're not necessarily the most beneficial to students or staff. So COVID was yet another transition, but the great thing is we, would, we, were, um, we were prepared, we've done it before. So engage with all the stakeholders in transition. Speak to the students, what do they want, what do they need? Does that marry up with what they require? And innovate, and we used the ACEs to innovate and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail shortly. Then you reflect. What went well, what didn't go well, what would you change, what would you keep, what would you throw out? Modification. And then unfortunately, if you think you've got the answer, all the variables change and you have to go through the whole process again. It's a sort of Bayesian reasoning, which is my new favorite word. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. During COVID-19, we needed to embrace new innovation and deliver the course content often away from the university environment. And we had certain tools that came to the fore, um, Teams, Zoom, online portals such as Canvas and Moodle, Big Blue Button, or is it Big Red Button? I'm not really sure, uh, that students can access material at any time. Now, clearly on this sort of medium that we're on today, um, teaching theory transfers relatively well with no perceived loss of fidelity but history taking and clinical examination clearly suffer to some degree particularly examination um, and then we had to design and implement constructively aligned online assessments which was pretty tough uh, because we were never sure whether we were going to be in the university or not right up until the time when those uh, assessments took place and going on with all this and this is not just the students we had uh, depression loss of confidence perceived de-skilling from students and staff and we needed to engage and nurture development of independent motivated level seven learners often at a distance tough so here was the answer 
or the answer at point in time it continually changes but the important thing is the students are always at the center you'll notice that i've covered bob spore's eyes don't look into the eyes because uh yeah he's, he's a very powerful gentleman um and again the answer changed but at the center of this was the students and mark bob uh myself jim when i was in a mess um we we all partnered about how we were going to achieve this so what did we do what about the specifics so i steal things from everyone that, that that's the reality we all do it if we've got any sense and jim mentioned to me and i ran with it that he had observed that during exams and the national exam, uh, students who read the question and have a structured plan approach the OSCE and tend to have a better outcome. Pretty intuitive. And I think we've seen that in the university as well. Um, so we came up with a, an innovation, the Golden Two. And what we basically do is on the team's medium, we get the students to engage in receiving a clinical vignette, coming up with a two minute plan about how they approach that specific vignette, and then feeding that plan back to their peers and the academic team. And then after that, maybe or maybe not the same person actually undertakes the OSCE, and then um, the ace that's playing it, Bob, uh, Matt, uh, will um, actually feed back about the communication side. Um, we also had hybrid PBLs. There's, there's an artificial concept that theoretical learning is separate to uh, real, real life uh, clinical scenarios. Of course it's not, this is artificial. You examine a chest, you need to have the underpinning knowledge. So what we actually do is get the ACEs on occasion to play a history taking role within the vignette of problem-based learning. And of course this can take place online. Um, we modified OSCEs as well. We had to prepare OSCEs that were reflective of the national exam at point in time, were flexible to run both online or in the university premises, pretty scary stuff. And what we found, I'm just thinking there, we, we ran a scenario that was a hybrid scenario of um, taking a history and examining a patient with shoulder pain, the sort of frozen shoulder scenario. And um, you had to modify, obviously, history taking was fine, focused history. But we specifically asked the student to talk the patient through active movements of the shoulder. And in actual fact, with good positioning, um, there wasn't a great um, reduction in fidelity there. Clinical teaching videos, we prepared these extensively and uh, with Mark and Bob, and we've had great fun. And what they actually do is they give us choices. So if we record teaching in a video format, students can access it at any time. We can give the students it ahead of lectures so they can watch before they attend. Or if that lecture is canceled, we have a, a piece of work that, that we can use to supplement online teaching. And the key, the key thing really is adaptability. Um, I was talking about that repeatable uh, unpredictability. One of my uh, favorite things has been working with one of the ACEs where we got him to play Mania. And those of you who are familiar with mania, uh, you're probably familiar with, with pressured speech, listening to me now, uh, and, and clanging. So clanging is a concept where the patient links seemingly unrelated words in almost a rhyming way. And this was an absolute masterclass played very consistently by the role player. Um, I taught him about how the student was gonna undertake a history in a manic patient and he was straight away on to history, 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 all part of the mystery. And this was, this, this was wonderful to behold. Um, what we need to remember is 40% of the national exam is actually 
labeled as communication and all the other concepts have an element of, of communication. So this really was an opportunity in COVID to focus something, focus on something that was particularly pertinent in any situation, COVID or not. And why are we doing this? Uh, the world of education has, has changed probably irreversibly. I mean, Aldous Huxley talked about a brave new world. I'm a, I'm a, a rheumatology patient. My outpatient appointments are taking place on the phone. They are taking place uh, on video. Back to that necessity, the mother of invention, and it's working well for me. We're reducing contacts and minimizing infection, but some of this will stay post COVID. Um, for economic reasons, clearly, we need to train students to work both in the pre-COVID world and the world after COVID because some of this is going to remain. So we get the ACEs playing the role of, a, for example, a distressed parent on the phone. Um, it's important we get the students ready for that. So, and this is my last slide, I'm sure you'll be relieved. How do we decide which technological advances to keep? Well, what we need to think about is, this is an SAMR model, which is used to think about that. Will they be a substitution? Will they be an augmentation? Will they be a modification or a redefinition? In other words, are they enhancing an existing thing or are they transforming and probably supplementing to some degree? And we need further research on this clearly. Um, and I'm hoping to perhaps get my colleagues talked into this at some point, but preliminary things would suggest if we were working on teams um, in, uh, and we were examining the, the use of ACEs online to um, help people to work from home, then clearly that's trans transformative. It's achieved, taking histories on teams. However, if we're looking at the effectiveness of using simulation to examine a patient, um, it, it clearly isn't something that can be supplemented. My, my opinion remains that needs to be done on site. If we were looking at comparing the ACEs with uh, things like an avatar, uh, there are certain programs where you can speak with an avatar to practice communication. They clearly don't have um, much use in the ability to train in subtle skills like building rapport, patient contract, breaking bad news, whereas the ACEs can do that well and give re real-time feedback. There's my reading list, and these are the students. Are we taking questions at the end, Mark? Uh, yes, we're taking questions after the comfort stop, Pete. Okay. Thank you. And be directed thank you very much for listening, guys. Thank you very much, Pete. That's great. Thank you. Everyone who's spoken so far has a long-standing experience of working with ACEs, some of them for some 12, 13 years. Our final speaker, Sarah Baig, has only worked with the ACEs this very year. So you're our newest contact, Sarah. Sarah is a pharmacist and currently program director for the independent prescribing course at the University of Birmingham. And Bob and I had great pleasure of working with Sarah for the first time recently. So Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I can't share my screen. I have put a few slides. Oh, I can now. Yeah, thank you. They're not as um, they're not as high tech as everyone else is. They're very basic. <laughs> there we go. OK, so I'm just going to talk about the pharmacists experiences with ACES teaching um, at the University of Birmingham. We have a multi-professional course, so we have nurses, pharmacists, we have physiotherapists. We also have paramedics. Um, optometrists, all sorts of professions who are on the course for independent prescribing. So it's a different perspective um, from me. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about pharmacy and ACEs and how we've incorporated them into the independent prescribing course. So as a, 
and Mark has said I'm new to the course so this is my first experience working with ACEs so ACEs contributed to the physical examination which is taught as part of the independent prescribing course um, which is in line with like the RPS GP standards so the standards mandate that um, the HCPC, NMC and the GPHC all follow the same standards and they, maintain, they, they mandate certain clinical skills that we have to teach the students um, we do have the multi-professional teaching, which is great, and it really helps enhance the student experience because we have often nurses um, who are very, very experienced in clinical examinations. We have physios who are great at things like MSK examination, joint examinations, and then we have pharmacists who have never done physical examinations. So there's a big um, variation in the um, students that we have. Um, and one thing that's really helped having the ACEs is that um, they've really helped to um, integrate those different skills and help to use the experience of other students to enhance the experience that the pharmacists get, which was really, really um, positive. We had lots of positive feedback about that too. So in terms of clinical skills teaching in particular, um, it was um, very positive in terms of the way we integrated the multi-professional aspect of it. Um, we had some of the physios demonstrating the neuro exam, the peripheral exam, so it was quite helpful as well, so getting their expertise. Um, and I think, again, I'm echoing what a lot of the other speakers have said. So for me, um, it was quite... Um, I was, I was really impressed by the ACEs. There was a lot of consistency in the teaching. Um, there was versatility. The, the ACEs are multi-skilled. They're able to teach lots of different systems, which was really, really helpful. Um, and I really like the way they built rapport with the students. So the again, I think going back to what the other, one of the other speakers was saying is that the students felt very comfortable with the ACEs. So they're able to say, like, I don't really know how to do this or I've never done this before, um, it, which was the case with a lot of the pharmacists. And the ACEs really put them at ease, made them feel that they could be open about their experiences and, and help to build those skills and, and, and that sort of relationship really over the course of the clinical skills teaching, which was really, really positive. Um, and one thing I really, really like about the ACEs, and I, I thought this was important to mention, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, is that the ACEs know the limitations, and I really like that. They'll never try and open, overstep the mark. So when they found that they didn't know a clinical reason why they were doing a certain assessment, they'd say, oh, Sarah, can we just ask you this? And it was really nice the way that they did that. And I thought that's really important as a professional to recognise your limitations. Um, it was great the way they provided feedback to students and again this is like echoing some of the other things that other speakers have said so the students really valued the feedback so like for example if a student was like obviously pressing too hard on the abdomen or if they weren't able to palpate the liver um, the ACEs were able to tell them that and and show them how to do it correctly which was really really useful um, there was a really high demand from students as well because we had three aces in our teaching and the ratio was about 26 students to three aces so um we noticed that a lot of students were like well well we don't want a role player we want an ace so there was that sort of you know we we, we recognized that straight away that there was a big difference between the way the, the role players were teaching and the way the aces were teaching and that's what really cemented my sort of passion and and sort of um i really like the way the aces were able to do that in that interactive way they, they taught the students um, and there was a real difference. I mean, pay, then we sort of flipped it so that the students that were confident, we said, right, so do you want to have a go on the role players? And then the students that were less confident, they focused more on their skills with the ACEs and that's how we managed that sort of um, the difference in skills. Um, the ACEs were used for the OSCE examinations. That was really helpful. Um, we had some very um, honest and appropriate feedback from the ACEs, which was included in our global assessment, as we call it. We have like um, an analytic, uh, analytical assessment, and then we have a global assessment. So ACEs had an active part in the assessment process as well. Um, and overall, it was a very um, good way of enhancing our student experiences. So the feedback has been absolutely amazing. And they've actually said that they'd like to have ACEs in other aspects of their course. So some of our students are our advanced clinical practitioners. So they've said, you know, is it possible to have ACEs on the ACP course? So this for me was really positive and I fed that back to the appropriate people as well. Um, in terms of the future, um, I think there's lots of scope for development uh, of clinical skills with the, with the ACEs. We can look at different skills um, that are not covered like you know in all the different because I know there's multi-professionals we have different syllabuses we have different requirements so looking at those and upskilling the the ACEs would be really helpful and I, I want to pose this question but I think there might be a role for specialist ACEs so could we have like a 
you know a cardiology specialist ace or a, a respiratory specialist ace or that's just something that I thought I'd, I'd bring to the forum um, and also we're going to be starting doing undergraduate teaching with MFARM so currently MFARM as in pharmacy students don't have exposure to clinical skills because it previously wasn't part of the curriculum but in the next two years it's going to be start, start being incorporated as part of the curriculum so that'll be interesting to see how ACEs interface with that as well um, and again just talking about collaboration so we have the benefit of having the multi-professional course at Birmingham for the independent prescribing um, but I think it really has benefits um, when we work with the different professions ACEs and then clinicians all collaborating together thank you that's it thank you thank you very much sarah i think what sarah has said though which is so important to today's conference is that in terms of simulated patients an ace is not a role player uh, an ace is a, a role player on steroids as bob likes to say so we are there to teach we are there to be involved with the teaching we are there to be physically examined and to help with the teaching of the student goodness knows all aces can role play as well but fundamentally we're there to assist with the teaching process and to hone these students' skills as they physically work upon us and we feedback how well they are doing it. It's now time for a comfort break. During the comfort break, please go on the chat box and give us your address because we at Medicate want to send you a handsome notebook for taking part in today's conference. Also in the chat box, Bob has just put on the YouTube link to a short three to four minute video which shows the role of the ace. You won't believe the two guys who are demonstrating. So while we have a, a bit of a comfort stop now, please take the time to watch the video. If you can't, it is available on YouTube uh, and you'll have time to watch it in the future. A good five minute break then. During the break, we'll be looking at questions that have been posed in the chat box and directed them to the relevant speaker after the break. And we will be back with you at around 1.30. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs> 